Hello and welcome back to my channel. Bonsoir et re bienvenue sur ma chaîne. My name is Muriel and this evening I will be doing a dual book review for The Year of the Witching by Alexis Henderson and The Witch's Heart by Genevieve Gornicek. A dual review because both of these books are related to the subject of, broadly speaking, witches, witchcraft. I read both of them in the month of October. I was originally supposed to make this dual review for the end of October for Halloween, but alas, I got slightly behind on my schedule. I will start by talking about the Year of the Witching specifically. So I came across this book, I think, on one of those random internet book searches. I was intrigued by this because it had to do with witchcraft. It was supposed to harbour some slight horror elements, have to do with the female empowerment aspect of witchcraft, I guess. So I thought to myself, this could be up my alley. Unfortunately, Unfortunately though, this is technically, well, I mean, I personally think this book is young adult, not adult fiction. I really thought it was going to be an adult fiction standalone in the genres of fantasy and light horror in relationship to witchcraft and female witches specifically, but this is more young adult than anything else. Which was a bit of a disappointment because as such I felt it was quite superficial on a lot of elements which are important to me in a novel. And when it comes to The Witch's Heart, I heard of this, again, a bit by chance. I was looking for a book to replace something else on my TBR, came across this, read that it was a Norse mythology retelling centered around a witch figure, specifically Angra Boda, who was Loki's wife in traditional Norse mythology. And like I mentioned in my October reading wrap-up, I didn't notice this at first, but what I really like about this novel's cover is that Angra Boda's children, who are hell, the Norse goddess of the underworld, Jormagander, the great serpent, and Fenrir, the wolf, all of which play important roles in the great central myth of Ragnarok. They're all present, illustrated in the tangles of Angraboda's hair, which I think is a really lovely little detail. And I can already tell you that I really greatly appreciated this book as well. So a few words about the Year of the Witching's premise. The Year of the Witching takes place in a fantasy universe, more specifically in the country of Bethel, which is basically a theocracy centred on some sort of absolute male deity. However, the religion also posits the existence of a dark female deity existing in opposition to the good male deity. It's a very dualistic system, and as a consequence of this, the book plays around with ideas linked to oppression of women by men and female empowerment through symbolic imagery linked to this dark, presumably evil goddess, but is she really? And the story also centers on a main female character, an older teenager named Emmanuel. Emmanuel is a mixed race, which has a bit of a part to play in the story's unfolding. Her mum basically eloped with a colored man, and that's looked down upon in their society. She was supposed to marry the the high priest of the country's religion as well. She eloped with this man and had Emmanuel in a creepy forest because yes there's a creepy forest in this book linked to witches who are supposed to be the descendants or the incarnations of this dark goddess. So Emmanuel has witchcraft in her ancestry and she might be entangled with some sort of curse to do with those archetypal witches living in this dark forest. Whereas with the witch's heart, well, I mean, basically, just like I said in the introduction, this is a mythological retelling. It centers specifically on this witch figure of Angra Boda, who became the wife of Loki. Basically, the story starts once Angra Boda has been kicked out of Asgard. This witch has a long, foggy past behind her. I mean, they are deities, giants, so presumably they're somewhat immortal figures. And she's forgotten a lot of her earlier life. She was, this is not really a spoiler, you learned this in the first few pages. She was burnt on a pyre three times by Odin and her heart was ripped out. It is called the witch's heart and there's a reason for that. And she finds herself in a forest at the edge of the Nine Worlds in Jotunheim, which was the realm of the giants. She is herself a giant. Giants are basically a kind of god, as far as I understand it, from what I've read about Norse mythology and the way it's portrayed in this novel. So she finds refuge in this forest, and that's where Loki meets her. And the story unfolds from there. It really centers on her as an individual character, but also on her very deep, complex relationships with both Loki, who became her husband, and Skadi, a goddess of Norse mythology, who 
well. There's a relationship between them. And it also focuses on her relationship to her children, who are said to have very important roles in the unfolding of Ragnarok, the end of the world in classical Norse mythology. Now, The Year of the Witching read very quickly to me. It's a story told in four parts. Each part is linked to a plague. We won't say more than that. And each part has several chapters, each of which is prefaced by an epigraph, which I actually always tend to enjoy. Those epigraphs are extracts from basically the main character's mother's diary and also extracts of the dogmas of Bethel's church, explaining how their religion functions, the symbolism attached to the good male god and the bad female god, things like that. It's always pretty basic, but it does give added world-building context, which, as I've said numerous times before, I always enjoy. And the writing style itself was fine. It was, again, pretty straightforward. Basic, I suppose, but not basic bad, just fine. I read through this very smoothly. It did the job of telling the book's story. What I will say, though, is that I, I did really enjoy some of the more visceral imagery put on display in the story. Imagery which was related to witchcraft, certain tropes and hallmarks of witchcraft representation in, I don't know, European folklore or other types of folklore. Images related to the darker incarnations of paganism, you know, that type of imagery. Things which might make you think of Salem, of the Blair Witch Project, I suppose, of just old tales of creepy dark forests and dark female figures haunting said forests and things like that. And also imagery to do with blood, menstrual blood in particular, and respect to the author for inserting that. And that's always the kind of imagery that just kind of speaks to me, especially blood-related imagery for personal reasons, I guess, broadly speaking. So I will definitely give points for that. Fortunately, I don't think said imagery was exploited well enough in relationship to theming or world building, but there was something there, just not quite enough to make me feel as satisfied as I would have liked to be. With The Witch's Heart, the structure's a bit different. There aren't actually any chapters, which I tend to not like. It's just continuous text cut up in paragraphs. However, I did find the writing reasonably engaging. Again, it's not the most lyrical or poetic kind of writing writing, but I thought it was simple yet elegant. It flowed very smoothly. I read through this very well, reasonably quickly, and it was a good reading experience overall from a purely stylistic point of view. And I will say that there was good emotional writing. It was written in a way that made me feel things pretty deeply, I might add, so I will also give points for that. And given the semi-historical slash mythological setting, you'll get some, I guess, I don't know, Germano-Scandinavian words related to the Norse myths and things like that. And yeah, setting appropriate vocabulary, basically. It was well done. I didn't have any issues with that. So not the most amazing writing, but it did the job it set out to do. And I did write a few quotes from this book. So like I said, especially with regards to expressing the emotions of the main characters, the author really did her job well. Character work-wise, I said that there's a main female character in the story called Emmanuel. She's about 17 years old, something like that. There is also a main male MC, and yes, there is the quintessential YA romance in this book. But well, I'll get back to that in a second. The main character was decently fleshed out. She's that type of character you would expect from a YA novel in a way not like other girls. She's shunned by a big chunk of her society because she is mixed race, because of the conditions of her birth, because her mum basically ran away to the creepy witch-linked woods. So she's loved by her family, but at the same time there's a lot of emphasis put on avoiding sin and remaining pure and clean and things like that. And she loves her family, but she also questions some things about her society, tempted by the darker aspects of a psyche, surrendering to it, but also overcoming it. Nothing revolutionary, however, it wasn't bad either. The characterization was decent and did the job of delivering the story, basically. There is a best female friend who isn't there that long. There is that main male OC who's just like two years older than her who becomes a love interest. Minor spoiler, I guess, but I mean, sorry, you can see it from miles away. It's just so freaking obvious that's what's gonna happen, and I called it as soon as I saw the very first signs of it. And 
Speaking of that romance, I it's not my favorite type of thing, especially when it's like this stereotypical kind of romance between two bloody teenagers. But it wasn't atrocious either. It wasn't offensively bad. It wasn't quite insta-lovey. There is a bit of friendship established beforehand. However, it does progress pretty quickly. Probably spurred on by dire circumstances and trying to survive, I suppose. So it's somewhat believable given the context of the world building. I'm being generous there, but fine, okay, it kind of works, I suppose. And even though the characters around the female MC aren't that well fleshed out, I definitely sense that the notion of family was very important. There's Emmanuel's grandmother who has a certain role to play and she has step-siblings and a grandfather. There is a main antagonist who is basically a leader of a fairly oppressive church, who is a massive creep. He was good enough as an antagonist, I suppose. I was probably more interested overall in the more nebulous archetypal witch characters, which are present in this creepy forest. So you don't really get that much background info about them. So it was serviceable character work. Given I believe it's a YA novel, I guess it was alright. Not that great, but not that bad either. Serviceable. However, The Witch's Heart is another story entirely because I would argue this is actually a character-driven novel, which isn't my initial preference. However, here it really, really worked for me. It was a strongly emotion-fueled mythological retelling, really centering on this main character of Angraboda and her relationships to her husband slash lovers, to her children, to her sense of self, to her family, to the world around her. This is really a book about character, not just character relationships, though those really impress me, but relationship to oneself as well and uncovering one's past. Because as I stated in the synopsis part, Angra Boda has forgotten a lot about her own past and you're rediscovering it alongside her. I really like that. You really get to know Angra Boda. She was the kind of character I could actually somewhat relate to this solitary witch trying to recover from pretty significant amounts of trauma, trying to reconnect with herself, with aspects of her magic. Then you follow her as she lets herself be vulnerable with a friend who becomes a lover and a husband in the case of Loki, or a lover in the case of Skadi. Minor spoiler as well, I guess, but yeah, I really appreciate that. That's the LGBT element, I suppose. Angraboda is technically bisexual, though it's never said as such, I guess, you know. Gods and giants don't really need to define their sexual orientation ultimately. And so I mentioned this LGBT element, but more generally the romance is in this book because yes, you do have a strong romance element, though it's not a romance-centric story, it's just that those romantic, I mean non-platonic relationships in Angraboda's life are very important to her and to, well, the unfolding of events linked to her family and then Ragnarok. I mean, Loki is a very important figure in Norse mythology and in the central myth of Ragnarok. Those character relationships were just beautifully fleshed out. Incredibly realistic, not necessarily super happy either. That relationship between Loki and Angraboda specifically really shows you the different stages of a complex relationship between a husband and wife. It wasn't abusive, I don't think it was ever abusive, but Loki is a- well he's Loki! He's a complex character, he's the trickster of Norse mythology. You would expect him to be a difficult man at times, and he is, and love doesn't always conquer all in that type of relationship. They're very bittersweet notes to it as well, but then you also have this lovely friendship which becomes something a bit more between Angraboda and Skadi. How that unfolds and develops over the years, because this book takes place over several, several years. Those relationship dynamics were so beautifully realistic, poignant because they were realistic and really moved me. And then you have her relationships with her children. Now, I'm not a fan of, like, maternal explorations in fiction. It's not something I tend to relate to. However, the way it was done in this book, I could feel something for it as well. There's quite a bit about family explored in this book, but family in a broader sense than just blood ties, the blood ties are very important as well. And I guess it also helped that some of Angraboda's children are not even human. So that probably helped me to relate to those types of maternal feelings in a way, because yeah, she has a giant snake and a wolf for children. And Hell is a very special daughter as well in her own way. So yeah, everything about this worked for me. And even if I couldn't relate 100% to some of the relationships, some of the feelings, all of it just created the whole that was very emotional, very visceral, and made me feel.
a lot. World building wise, so I already stated this takes place in some sort of light fantasy universe given that witchcraft is a thing. There are these two deities mentioned, very dualistic pantheon. There's the, well, you're told there's the good male god and the dark bad female goddess. Obviously, you're given to understand that things might be a bit more complicated than that and the truth might have been manipulated by people in power, which doesn't really come as a surprise in this kind of story. I guess it takes place in a world that's somewhat reminiscent to the 18th century maybe in period I mean firearms are a thing in this world so make of that what you will and think just the atmosphere of any kind of story to do with classical imagery related to witchcraft I mentioned Salem I mentioned Blair Witch Project think in a way I suppose a little bit of the witch or just yeah classical imagery of Western medieval witchcraft or Renaissance witchcraft, darker pagan flavorings to the imagery put on display, that kind of stuff. There is this oppressive church. You're told that women are not considered quite equal to men and men can practice polygamy. There is a main priest, a high priest leader of the church who can have a shit ton of wives and he is a creep and does bad things. And also there are people who are darker skinned and they're considered lesser and this country of Bethel is actually encircled by this dark creepy forest harboring these archetypal witches descended from this dark goddess. You are told there might be other countries outside but it's all pretty nebulous and it's never really explored with any depth. However, this might be the start of series. I really thought it was a standalone but then when you go on Goodreads it says Bethel number one. So maybe the author wants to continue telling stories in this world. I'm not sure. You'll have to check that out for yourselves. The world building isn't that well fleshed out overall. There were some major inconsistencies, most notably regarding this aspect of Bethelian society being very oppressive towards women. I mean, yes, but at the same time you see female characters being pretty free and going around and it's like what you're told about how bad and oppressive the society is doesn't always match what you're actually given to see on the page. It's again one of these issues to do with telling, not actually showing or having a mismatch between what you're told and what is shown. So I thought that was disappointing. However, given it's a YA novel, maybe it's good enough for that general category of literature, I don't know. But yeah, I was able to poke quite a few holes in the basic world building of this novel. The magic itself, I mean, I don't know that there's a magic system as such. There's blood related magic, using sigils, invoking a dark goddess, invoking curses, bloodlines, things like that. Very, again, classical witchcraft imagery related stuff. And I love that kind of imagery, don't get me wrong. That's what I really liked about this book the imagery and the hearkening back to classic symbols of witchcraft, darker paganism or just paganism generally and nature related things. But beyond that, there wasn't much to see or to chew on, unfortunately. And with the witch's heart, it's Norse mythology. I mean, it's a Norse mythology retelling, so there are lots of references to classical Norse mythology. Gods, giants, creatures, events from Norse mythology, more specifically Ragnarok, things which I was very familiar with, being a huge mythology nerd, and I loved seeing that put on display in this book. Beyond that, I suppose, you know, there's a related semi-historical setting of ancient Scandinavia, ancient Germany, or I mean, you know, Germano-Scandinavian regions, ancient Vikings, things like that. Actually, Vikings are directly mentioned in this book. There are objects and words which are setting related. It all felt decently realistic, besides the mythological bits, obviously, and the magical bits. All the actions, objects, words seemed setting appropriate. So nothing broke my suspension of disbelief or made me go, isn't that pretty anachronistic? No, there was no issue there at all. In fact, I do feel obliged to bring up Circe, which is the other mythological retelling I find is somewhat similar to this. I prefer this way more to Circe, by the way. Circe didn't feel, well, it did feel anachronistic in a few of its elements, actually. If you want, you can check the review I did for it two years ago now. Something about the setting of Circe's home felt off. Something about the depictions of the gods felt off to me. Whereas 
as he had just flowed so smoothly, there were lots of references to classical Norse law, but it was also reworked a bit, you know, to create this modern, or I mean, contemporary retelling. Like, there is this lesbian romance, if you will. I have no idea how the ancient Germano Scandinavian peoples conceptualize that. It surely existed, but I don't know if they were tolerant of that or not, but here you can kind of go with the excuse, they were gods and giants. Do gods and giants even care about this stuff? I mean, hell, in most pagan pantheons, siblings do it with one another, gods with animals and shit, so a bit of gay sex isn't really a big deal, I suppose. That's how I justified it in my mind. Besides, it's not historical fiction proper, it's a mythology retelling. So yeah, the world building was exactly what it needed to be, and I had no major complaints. As with the world building, the theming here was pretty light. There wasn't much for me to chew on there. There are a lot of hallmarks of YA theming, basically. I'm being very dismissive of the YA category. I'm sorry, I don't know everything that exists in that category. I'm sure there are examples of YA literature that have decent theming. But yeah, that's just not been my experience, so take it as you will once again, or take it with a pinch of salt. Oh yeah, I have the classic YA hallmarks of coming of age and finding your way in an adverse society, fighting injustice. <laughs> But funnily enough, that's actually stuff I've encountered mostly in like YA dystopias, but here it's YA fantasy light horror. Fighting injustice, in this case, sex-based discrimination, skin color-based discrimination to a lesser extent, fighting the evil, powerful antagonists and trying to change things while still protecting your loved ones and trying to help your family, all that stuff, which there's nothing wrong with that, right? Those are decent themes, I just think, you know, you can explore them in more interesting or deeper ways than they were here. So yeah, I mean, beyond that, I guess there is that seedling of this idea of, you know, male-based religions against female nature-based religions. But I've read the likes of The Mists of Avalon. This shit can be done so much better and in much more meaningful and deeper ways than in this. Though, yes, I can acknowledge that the most basic iteration of that is present in here. Playing around with that, you know, classical witchcraft-related imagery. With The Witch's Heart, however, there is the fact that I think it's principally a character-driven story with a very strong emotional impact. I do think there were a few interesting themes being developed through said characters and character interactions. This story definitely plays around with the conflict between self-determination and fate or destiny, given that Ragnarok is a big feature of the story and Ragnarok has always been told in mythological tales as having been foretold by a few deities, I think the Norns, though maybe I might be wrong on some of the details, but I mean, the point is in the Norse pantheon, you do have deities who can see into the future. Now, in this novel, Angraboda is a witch who can practice a type of magic that allows her to divine future events and see the future, and this causes her immense distress. So there are a fair few times when she wonders if she can do anything to change the future or if she's missing a few key elements of information, and there are other deities trying to do the same thing, most notably Odin, and Odin was definitely said in Norse mythology to be able to see into the future. Then you have the really big theme of love and family and belonging and finding your people, finding your tribe, finding your kin, the people who will accept you for who you are, the people who will also challenge you and challenge what you think of love, what you think love is or can be, and family just because Agraboda has these children who are fated to play important roles in the unfolding of Ragnarok. Hell, her husband as well, Loki has a big role to play in Ragnarok, and she just wants to protect her family, she just wants to find peace with her family, but that's not really in the cards, unfortunately. So there's a lot of grappling with all of that, quite painful grappling with the inevitability of fate, or at least those parts of fate which truly are set in stone. Linked to love and family, there's also this idea that sometimes you have to let go of the people you love, because despite the fact that you're attached to them, they are causing you harm, they are hurting you, and they break your trust. That's what I said in the part about character work. You really have this rich, complex relationship unfolding between Angraboda and Loki, a relationship which is pretty bittersweet and not always with the happiest of outcomes, but that is very realistic. It happens in real life, it barely happened. <laughs> 
the gods and giants. So letting go of things, accepting change, accepting the fact that relationships can change. They can also change without ending, but they can take a different form and things like that. Centered more directly and specifically on Angra Boda herself, there's the theme of finding yourself, accepting yourself, loving yourself, coming to grips with the true nature of your identity and embracing it, coming to terms with trauma, learning to surrender your heart to love, and while surrendering your heart to the risks inherent in embracing new love and forming new relationships. It's something that can be very scary, but at the end of the day, it's probably worth it, even if your heart gets bruised again in the future. And then linked to both this big theme of family, love, belonging, and identity coming to terms with who you are, there's also this big, maybe not so much a theme as a storytelling thread of sacrifice, sacrifice for something greater than yourself. And linked to that, which is something I've seen quite often now in stories which deal with gods, archetypes, myths, this idea of memory. What is it about humans, human culture, human relationships that has the potential of being immortal? What parts of us can survive the ages because especially given that there's, you know, the world-ending event of Ragnarok, the changing of ages, but there's some things that stay in human memory, and we're talking about gods and giants, and they themselves mention being worshipped by humans and being concerned with being remembered or being forgotten, and what is it about them that will be remembered or forgotten. So memory, collective human memory, memory linked to strong emotions and relationships, memories of one's life and memories of one's age, in a way. It's pretty poignant stuff, not necessarily fleshed out in the deepest way imaginable, but it was definitely there and added an extra layer of emotionality to this novel. In conclusion, so I gave two ratings, actually, to The Year of the Witching. Keeping in mind it's a YA novel, if I'm feeling lenient, I would give this a 6.5 out of 10. However, if it were an actual adult fiction novel, it would only be a 6 out of 10. Don't think about this too deeply, it makes sense in my mind, but yeah, it's that general rating. 6 to 6.5 out of 10. I really like the visceral witchcraft related imagery, the dark paganism related imagery, which is with dark sensuality attached to them, animal skulls, a dark creepy forest, blood imagery, that kind of stuff. I really dug that. Beyond that, however, there really wasn't that much to this novel. A lot of untapped potential, I felt, but as it stands, this was quite light. Especially on the world building and theming front, the character work was serviceable, very YA in some of the tropes put on display. It was a fast read. It <laughs> passed the time. And there was that pretty decent imagery, sure, but I'm definitely not inclined to follow on with this series if it is an actual series, given that I maintain this is YA literature and I do not do YA literature anymore. The Witch's Heart, however, I really freaking enjoyed this. I gave this an 8 out of 10. I guess it's more of an 8 out of 10 on a purely enjoyment basis. Perhaps it's more of a 7.5 out of 10 if I were only to consider the depth of the theming. I don't know, again, the way I rate things factors in a lot of different things. I'm happy rating this at a light 8 out of 10, basically. It definitely had a very strong emotional impact for me. I was impressed by the character work and those character relationships, even though I'm not primarily a character-driven reader. And I just wept. <laughs> I wept at the end of this novel. It also just touched upon things which felt very, very relatable to me now for personal life reasons. So I also just probably read this at the right time. Maybe if I were to read this in the future, I'd feel slightly differently about it, though I'm still pretty confident in my rating overall. But yes, I wept at the end of this novel. Something about it was just so poignant and beautifully bittersweet. I haven't cried so hard at a book since finishing The Winning Flame back in spring of this year. Yeah, I would definitely recommend it as a proper mythological retelling. It was engaging, it was meaningful. I love it when a book's title actually has an important role to play in the unfolding of the book's story. Yeah, and I definitely prefer this to Cersei. Again, Cersei wasn't bad, it was disappointing. Here I went in with, well, without any specific type of expectation really, and I was very pleasantly surprised. Plus it's Norse mythology. I feel like that's less common than perhaps Greek or Roman mythology, and 
Now, again, Marvel doesn't count. I would, well, I mean, there are Arthurian retellings out the wazoo, but I would enjoy Celtic mythology-based retellings that aren't Arthurian mythos related. Even though I do love the Arthurian mythos, I think Egyptian mythology doesn't get enough love either. Neither does Sumero-Babylonian mythology, for that matter, or Slavic mythology. I would definitely recommend this as a solid mythological retelling, character-driven, with very good character development, wonderful, richly textured character relationships, and just all those delicious mythological references, really, which I always love. And that's the end of my review. I hope you found it informative, enjoyable. If you've read any of these books and want to share your thoughts with me, please feel free to do so. In the meantime, however, I hope you all have a lovely day, evening, or whichever time of day you prefer. Do take good care of yourselves, and I shall see you all again reasonably soon in another video. Bye-bye!